Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Graveyard Shift. I'm your host Max Kellerholz and we're going to be doing something a little different today. I wasn't able to get everybody in the same room. Midterms are coming up for most of my friends so getting everybody in the same room was a bit difficult. So what we're doing today is it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each individual guest where they talk about their favorite paranormal horror film. Um, there's a lot of varying movies that we're going to be talking about but I hope you do enjoy each and all my friends talking about what particular horror movie they like. And at the very end, I will talk about a, a paranormal horror movie that I highly recommend. And yeah, we're going to move on to the first one up. We're now going to go move into Adrian's uh, movie of choice, which is... Yes, I loved this film growing up. <laughs> it was so much fun. Uh-huh. Yeah, it scared me too. Because, like, the house was just freaky as fuck, bro. Yeah, like, like back then, I, I don't know about you, I saw, saw this on Cartoon Network. I did too. Most. Yeah, there was, like, this one, and then, like, the other poorly animated Halloween one, which isn't as good. Mm hmm But, like, Monster House stuck out to me. It's mm -hmm. just a fun movie. Mm hmm Like. I think it's very well written. It, oh, yeah, I think it's well written, too. And, like, it deals with attachment, too, which is a good a good theme that is the monster house it's a fun movie mm -hmm. about it, three yeah, what like, so, like young teens preteens they're not like grown ups like teenage grown ups because you do see that there's a difference with like the babysitter they're yeah they're hitting puberty. they're hitting puberty and there's like they're you could tell people. you could tell that there's the teenagers with the babysitter and her boyfriend those are teenagers and these are kids these are just like your it's yeah. Typical '80s kid protagonists. And then there's the grandpa who lives in a creepy house. The creepy old neighbor, played by Steve yeah. Buscemi. Yeah, I'm, I'm like looking at like the cast right now to you know remember like everything. And yeah, I just I just noticed that Steve Buscemi is mm -hmm. the old guy. That's Which I feel like that is such a good typecast. <laughs> he looks just like him. He does. He does. Which is. Which is criminal. <laughs> That's how I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't need a live action monster house, but we don't need to get into that. But other news about that is the old man takes care of the house. Anyone near? No one touch my lawn. Exactly. And little do we know. Spoiler. Uh, the house is a monster, but the title didn't give it to you already. Hold on, I'd say it's it's technically not a, it's a possessed house. It's like the house itself has a spirit within it that basically, yeah, it did become like, yeah, that's why it's called a monster house. But I love the anatomy of the house and how they realized it. Yeah. Oh well. Mhm. Mm Everything was thought out on like where things will be and what they need to do. Mm -hmm. It does have one of those. Top ten like jokes that goes over kids' heads with like the yeah. the <laughs> that's it's uvula. I thought only girls had that. What? <laughs> Great joke. Great joke. I know this. I also know that this film has like a lot of memes now. Yeah, especially with chowder. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The puppy one. Mm -hmm. So our main characters are DJ Chowder and Jen. Mm-hmm. So Puppy Chowder. The comic relief guy. Mm -hmm. Very funny guy. Very funny. He's also a, he's a baller, though. I'll give him He's a baller. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you that. Yeah, going through it, uh, Ken and James are the cannon hustlers. Yes, they are. As, they're the cops. <laughs> yep, they are the officers. They're hilarious, though. What about this did gravitate towards you as a kid, specifically? Uh, the paranormal aspect of it. And just being a kid with a big fantasy like growing up, like just that aspect. I didn't have a lot of horror things, so I never watched a lot of that when I was a kid. So when Halloween came around and I saw them like it looks fun. It's mm -hmm. scary and fun. I mm -hmm. like it. So that was a kind of depressing story. Yeah. Yeah. Once you find out the backstory behind the house, you are kinda like, uh, oh, it sucks, like that shouldn't have happened. It's a tragic gothic tale told through a like family-friendly Amblin Entertainment film. Yeah, you learn the old guy is 
and the upper deck where it isn't really a bad guy who's just trying to keep everyone safe. Mm-hmm. Ex- yeah, yeah. I do know one behind the scenes fact that would is kind of funny. The head writer behind the film is a guy named Dan Harmon. He's the guy who wrote Community and then went on to write Rick and Morty. Wow. And he created Rick and Morty. That's crazy. It's kind of fun to see like all those like proto Rick and Mortyisms kind of thing in this movie. And like the really sharp dialogue, like the really fun crazy idea of this monster house which rick and morty just then just goes buck wild and i'm not i'm just gonna say this i'm not a huge fan of that show but i have nothing against it i just don't like the fandom (laughs) i'm just gonna say it Eh, that's a subject for another time (laughs) but yeah i just wanted to point that out because it is a very interesting thing that behind the scenes thing about who wrote this film i don't know specifically who directed it at the moment I have a question though because you're a big like anime guy and like you, you pay attention to animation. What do you think about the animation in the film? I think it's very good for its time. The movie came out in 2006, mm-hmm. and like a lot of like good Disney films also came around that time. Yep. And it holds up around that time, and I think it holds up decently well now. Mm-hmm. You know, for it, its time. It kind of reminds me like a very good PlayStation Two game. Definitely. Where it's kind of, yeah. I feel like the writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is close. Mhm. I think the writing is just so good, and the story, and everything is so fun that you could kind of look past it. Oh yeah. Again, you you kind of said it already, but it is a very fun, fun kids paranormal film. Yeah, you look at it as a kid. It's a fun story, but as you grow up and realize the things that it's teaching you. Mhm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It hits. Shit hit different? Yeah. <laughs> it's different audiences and that has the different messages. Mm-hmm. Do you have any final thoughts on the film uh, before we move on? Um, I mean, without going into spoilers, uh, overall, it's a, it's a fun film to watch. If you want to experience it even more, get drunk, get hot. <laughs> Jesus. Be plastic. Be plastic <laughs> watching it. It'll be a way more fun time. Yes, enjoy this family-friendly entertainment film by getting royally yeah, plastered. Your age, your age, other age viewers, no. All right, okay. Thank wow. you for putting that asterisk in. Hey, YouTube community guidelines. All right, we're going to move on now. Okay. So now we have Nick's choice of paranormal movie, and what movie have you brought with us today? So today I decided to talk about Ghostbusters, Uh classic as you would say of halloween mm-hmm. yeah i'd say <laughs> i'd say like it's an all-around good like yearly good film like but during the month of halloween it is definitely a must-have definitely i i, I think i would consider it a family film in my books because i mean when i first watched it i was about second grade um which is i mean might be different for other people but i felt like that it wasn't like at really like a adult film so i mean it's mm-hmm. for all ages i mean I, it's something that like parents always want to show their kids because it's like that was their generation of like new comedy slash drama so it was excited mm-hmm. to uh, get a taste of that back then exactly yeah i mean this was definitely the most adult like thing growing up for like young people at least my age group i'm well I should say this. I watched this via reruns on TV initially. We watched this at like on Nick at Night, and this was like the best thing to watch on Nick at Night. I'd say. Oh, definitely. I remember those times. Mm-hmm. It was so much fun to watch and like quote afterward. Like, I don't know. All the characters are so like lovable, memorable. Exactly. Dan Aykroyd, uh, Bill Murray. Yeah, Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Uh, I I can't remember the Egon's uh, name, but. It's it was Harold Ramis. Harold Ramis, yes. He was he was awesome in it and mm-hmm. I mean it's good to see that he had those chances before his passing. So that was great. Mm-hmm. He he mostly directed actually. Like he did a uh, Groundhog Day. I think he did Stripes. I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that later. He mostly directed things. So he was more behind the scenes like later in life. So I can't really say that like he wasn't that successful. He just was doing stuff in a different way. But yeah, no, Harold. No, definitely. But 
he did bring something to Egon here where it's just like, oh man, like love that character. Exactly. I mean, along with that, like the special effects back then, I mean, that was still cutting edge and everything, mm-hmm. all new, all different. Mm-hmm. Um, the mix between the practical effects that were happening within it, as long as with the uh, visual or virtual effects, mm-hmm. um, with the with the small ghosts and stuff. I mean, like uh, the green classic ghost that you see in Ghostbusters, that was like the Slimer. biggest, like the Slimer. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, he was like the biggest, like thing for visual effects back then mm-hmm. oh definitely that alongside the uh beams of the guns i mean like that that really changed like how people did stuff going forward in a sense mm-hmm. i kind of like the cheesiness of the effects and i love this like style of like it was clearly filmed against a green screen but oh yeah like i love that it's all puppets and stuff i love like the library ghost um i love the terror dogs um, oh the terror dogs yeah those i mean those where you could easily see how like it's like kind of like that puppet practical effect but like i feel like that's so much more genuine than like nowadays with like having everything being like so cgi yeah exactly i, I don't know i love the scene like when it's all like the ghosts get out of the containment thing and like it's just that beautiful light show in the sky and it has a really creepy like song that's playing we'll get into like the soundtrack in a bit but man this film is so so fun like exactly and like it's so pretty i shouldn't say pretty it's got that new york grit oh for sure i mean like it's it's that 80s new york that Mm -hmm. you've always like thought about and stuff i mean like you get a little bit of that from like i guess like a little bit from seinfeld even though that was 90s you get Mm -hmm. like that kind of like the uh on the dirt in the city new york and it's good to see in a movie like that too like you're just like seeing like people in the streets they they're running around and stuff i mean like the thing before that would be um or night night fever i feel like that was the or uh that was before this yeah right but like i'm saying like those kinds of things where it's like in new york in that time everything like that Mm -hmm. no i yeah no one i know what you mean and i very much agree say this i love the effect of the uh stay puffed marshmallow oh yes I mean, how can you forget that? Like, that was so, it was so different and new. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a little mix of both the practical and the visual effects, because I feel like that they used, um, I heard that they used claymation for parts of that and added it on on top. Uh, So like, that was great uh, use of that. Overall, the comedy, the well-written part of it. I mean, like, it's something where you can, like, even as a kid, you could get some of the jokes. Like, yes, there were a bunch of stuff that went over your head, but there was still stuff you could laugh at Mm -hmm. and you could still enjoy. I don't know. Bill Murray has some of the best lines. Like, I still sometimes quote, like, he slimed me. (laughs) Because I love that that part where it's just, like, you cut to him and he's on the ground, like, writhing and just all this goo. Casually just says, he he slimed me. (laughs) Great delivery there. Um, That plus the... um, When when they ask you if you're a god, you say yes. Yeah. That's like the perfect line that people still say today, I feel like. Yep. Mm -hmm. And like we uh, discussed before this, um, you never forget that it's actually supposed to be this paranormal movie. Mm -hmm. You think about it, like you're... You're like thinking about like all these like paranormal movies or like stuff with like spirits Mm -hmm. and like I don't know like pops in your head paranormal activity, The Shining, Mm -hmm. Evil Dead, Evil Dead, yeah exactly. Both the original and the reboot. I mean like those are the things that pop in your head. But Mm -hmm. then you think about it, you're like, I guess Ghostbusters can fit in this category. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, I love I love the nature of just like they treat it like exterminators, or it's just like like we get shit pay. We get, we live in a rundown area. No one treats us well, but we have a job to do and we go in and do it. I love that nature of these guys. Definitely. Do you have anything else to say before we like move on? I, I mean, uh, the only thing we were talking about otherwise is just the soundtrack. I feel like yeah. it oh, yeah. gave us one of the, one of the greatest, um, Halloween songs of, uh, of all time. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, uh, Ray Parker Jr., I think so. Is that him? Yeah. Yes. With his uh, writing and everything, it was great to have something like that come along. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited even to see this new quote-unquote reboot slash sequel to uh, Ghostbusters that come. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that's being directed actually by uh, Egon's son. 
Oh, really? I didn't know that. What, 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 Harold Ramis, you said? Yeah, Harold Ramis. I said. Yeah. Yeah, his son. He's the one who's directing the new movies and everything. So I, I, I like to see I thought the it was, continuation. I thought it was Jason Reitman. Isn't Ivan, he the son of Harold Ramis, though? No, I, uh, Ivan Reitman directed the first Ghostbusters and second oh, Ghostbusters. Oh, that's it. Okay, so the, the think, writer of the first one is yeah. directing the continuous. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. So I'm it is still there. like a family thing of like father son thing but yeah no it's jason reitman not harold ramus gotcha mm -hmm. i was mixing that up there my mistake it's all right but yeah it's, it's right. good it's good to see that continuation mm -hmm. and the father son duo like it, it's the story passing along for generations i got yeah exactly well, all right yeah that's all, pretty much all i really have to say about ghostbusters works for me thank you for having me mm -hmm. thank you for coming back <laughs> that's been uh nick's segment so now we're going to move on to another paranormal movie, and this time it's going to be Megan's pick, which is... Coraline! I have seen this film, and I really like this film. Um, but, Megan, why don't you give like a little breakdown of what the movie is about, since you love this film. All right, sounds good. Well, so basically, this film is all claymation, and the animation style is super cool, but... It's about a girl named Coraline who is, she moves into a house that seems very, you know, creepy. Something's off about it. Mm -hmm. And um, as she lives in the house more and more, she meets a boy named YB. And they become, you know, sort of friends. She's a little bit annoyed by him, but mm -hmm. they, they're, you know, they know each other. And she discovers a portal in the house that takes her to another world. This world is everything is it's like her world, but it's it all seems to be better. Everything is better. Her parents, she has another mother and her other mother seems to be everything that her mother isn't. And she starts falling in love with this like new world that she's visiting. She visits it every night and it, it's a and then things start to get a bit crazy in the other world. And it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like this film too i love just like the the whimsy and wonder that it has about mm -hmm. everyday things and like how drab the normal world is and how um just fantastical and bright uh the uh i wouldn't say imagination imaginary world is but the other like the other world is yeah you talked about the stop motion a bit but yeah this film is also made by the same guy who did a, a nightmare before christmas so it's like peak stop motion animation like there's a lot of really clever things that they do i think one of my favorite things is like there's a moment where like Coraline messes with like the shower and like yellow like rusty water comes out of it and you could clearly yes. tell that it's like little plastic rods just like animated and I, th mm -hmm. I thought that was really funny getting to like play with the stop motion nature of it all and just have fun with it and like everything is just so smooth and yeah i think also like it's so it's really well written to the point where like Coraline and YB feel like real kids just like goofballs and you know having fun they really do yeah especially YB yeah. he's he's me and a lot of other kids I knew growing up growing up he is a bit of a goofball mm -hmm. and you know his cat too yeah 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 voiced by Keith Davis um yes you specifically wanted to pick this movie and I, why this movie why did you want to talk about this movie this movie, it kind of evokes like a sense of, you know, being a kid. It partly, I think it's the animation style, the fact that, you know, the people behind the scenes were putting, you know, so much work into making these little dolls makes it feel very immature in like the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And I'd, and I think that, you know, as you were saying, like, it's very whimsical you know, the soundtrack, it, everything is very ominous and eerie mm. in the movie, too, mm -hmm. which leaves you, you know, after the movie ends, even though it comes to, to a sort of resolution, it still leaves you feeling unsettled. And I really like that, especially in movies that are supposed to be, you know, like for, for kids, for mm -hmm. a general audience. I think it's super cool that they were able to instill that feeling of that things are off. And mm -hmm. I think it makes the movie perfect, you know, for Halloween which is around the corner, I think it makes it perfect for just feeling it. It does feel very, again, immature, very childlike, but in a very cool like way that doesn't get old for me. I feel like it's very nostalgic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I very much agree with everything you said. Like, it's just 
especially with the point of like when like you're a kid and stuff like that like things like kind of seem like a little too creepy but you can't really tell adults because they just won't believe you or mm -hmm. they'll think you're crazy and i feel like this film yeah. unlike a lot of other films that try to do it and come off as very like eh, like it, it just doesn't feel the same this film mm -hmm. i could totally buy that like the parents wouldn't believe this girl because everything that she's saying sounds too much like it's a dream or fantastical and right. you set up Coraline as this little girl who is very how do I say this like bratty a little bit yeah she does come off as you know a bit a bit of a, a hard child to deal with but mm -hmm. you know at, like a, on, as the parents so if you hear as, as the parents of a child who's being difficult if mm -hmm. you hear her saying you know oh like I, I, I'm going through a portal. I'm going to this other world. Like, you got to believe it. Like, my other mother would have bought these gloves for me. I think it would be very easy to just easily, like, dismiss her and be like, oh, yeah, sure, honey. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. sure. Like, exact. Like, you you do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do make her very bratty. But I also like that she's reasonable in why she's acting a certain way. Because, like, she's moving into a new house. She had to say goodbye to all of her old friends. Her parents are, like, kind of ignoring her for the most part. And everybody has, like, valid reasons why everything is going on. Like, the parents are just overbooked with work and everything. Like, I think the, my favorite image in this film is the dad on the computer. And you just... Yeah. I've, had, I've used the image before, but it is so funny. Just seeing, like, this guy just, like... He, he just looks, like, sunken and swollen and just, like... Ugh, just He's got no life in him. And so it just makes Coraline feel very... Like, she, she, she definitely pops out in this world. And, like, also, like, all the yep. different tenants that are in the building. Like, you got that guy on top who has all the rat circus. Oh, Obis, Bobinski. Yeah, 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 thank you. I don't remember uh -huh. most of the names of the tenants. I also really, I will say I do like the two uh, old ladies with the, oh, uh, God, what are they called? The Pomeranians? I think that's what they're called. Yeah, uh, I don't remember, I don't remember their names. I don't remember the names of them, but. I don't either. But um, they totally remind me of something out of like uh, something you'd see in like uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, where it's just like yeah. these people with over exaggerated body parts and such. And I feel like <laughs> that's definitely those two. And I don't know. It's just yeah. Like most of the other um, films we've talked about so far, with everybody else, uh, I know a little bit of behind the scenes info about this. Uh, we talked earlier about like how the same guy who did a. Nightmare Before Christmas, Henry Selleck made this movie, and you could definitely mm -hmm. see his influence on everything. Um, but one thing I really like about this film is it's written by one of my favorite writers, uh, Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. If you don't know who that is, he's responsible for stuff like uh, The Sandman, comic and Netflix show, and he also wrote the book and helped write the TV show Good Omens. So, Very cool. Yeah, so you definitely see his, like, style of whimsy and quirky humor throughout this film as well and yeah i think it's just a perfect little horror family film and it's downright creepy like the other mother when she like shows her final form that shit's creepy as hell bro it really is and to i went to a behind the scenes showing of it where they did a re-showing mm -hmm. in theaters just like this past summer cool and they had like a they had maybe five or six different costumes for that transition um, from the other mother being her normal self to her, you know, monstrous self. Mm -hmm. The evolution or like the evolution of her, you know, it looks like she's just growing and transforming, but it was actually six different dolls that they were moving and contorting in different ways to make it look like it was a seamless transition, That's which I think is so cool. And also just like the amount of work that they had to put into literally every single detail is so impressive. Like, huh? I did not know. I, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Like when you're doing stop motion, you have to do every single frame. And so when you get yeah. like a continuous shot of something like just growing and transforming, yeah, that's a lot of work because you have to do each individual puppet or a little marionette or like, yeah, marionette thing. And yeah, like, wow. It is really fascinating. And I think, the amount of like the amount of time and effort and artistic skill that goes into all of those figures and all of the you know 
down to the movement of the hair mm -hmm. to get movement of hair in stop motion to get hair to stick up in certain frames and go down in others mm -hmm. when you're just taking a picture of it and putting them all together mm -hmm. is really difficult so they had one person just one person whose whole job was like hair makes sense <laughs> yeah it, which just, is yeah. really cool it makes sense to me because like yeah like while everybody else is like focused on getting all the body movements right and the face is all correct like yeah you just want one guy or a girl behind the scenes like tweaking each individual strands of hair that way it's just dead. yeah it makes sense like i love stop motion films especially from the company that made this leica which mm -hmm. i don't know if they're still in business or doing much as of late but they've done a lot of really cool films that some we've yeah. talked about before but yeah i just i just love the studio and i love seeing what they what they might be doing next and i hope that some bigger studio picks them up and like distributes their film because a lot of their films don't make that much money which sucks but it's just the case right yeah do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap up this up i don't think so i mean i just love this movie <laughs> fair enough good. it's a good movie watch it if you haven't that's all we got from megan thank you for sharing your thoughts on that cat mm -hmm. what movie did you bring to the paranormal episodes today i brought lights out the movie mm -hmm. so what is lights out about it is essentially paranormal where a woman is like seen in the dark mm -hmm. um and it's usually when the lights are obviously out it's mm -hmm. dark and you know the trailer shows that when you like flick the light switch mm -hmm. off then she, you can be seeing her in the darkness, like, coming closer to you. Mm -hmm. And each time, like, she gains more space in the darkness, then she kills you and gets closer to you and stuff. Okay. And the premise is, like, basically the a family who is affected by this shadow kind of darkness. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, for spoilers, like she ends up being like a the main character's mother's, I don't know, it's just like some kind of figure that her the mother has made up in her head that has come to life. Like an imaginary friend? Yeah, basically. But it's like not imaginary because she can still kill you and hurt you and physically toss you around or scratch you. Hmm. But um, the mother... A spoiler alert ends up killing herself to erase both her and this imaginary friend and then the rest of the world is like safe from this shadow person hmm. so why specifically this movie did you want to bring it up um it's one movie that i enjoy a lot and i think it's really spooky it was one of the ones that affected me most where i was not able to really sleep after watching it without a nightlight. <laughs> so I do recommend watching it. It's a very good popcorn movie thing. And I especially recommend like seeing it on a bigger screen because then you really feel like you're like actually there hmm. and also watch it in the dark. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it sounds like a movie to just like the perfect Halloween movie to like have when it's like at night, lights are out. It's just the screen lighting everything around you. I don't know. It sounds very fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I only know like two behind the scenes facts about this movie. One of them being this movie started out as like a short film. Mm. And it like passed around and said, hey, you should check this out. You should check out this uh, really cool uh, little horror film called Lights Out. And... I believe the guy who made The Conjuring saw it and asked, do you want to make this into a movie? And that's what happened. Wow. And the guy... Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. And then the guy who made this movie went on to make Shazam 1 and 2. Oh. So it's kind of interesting how, like, like different <laughs> this guy's, like, career is gone. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because I love The Conjuring series as well. Mm -hmm. And, like, the jump scares are... Like, they really get you. Mm -hmm. From what I know about this film, I haven't seen it. So it's kind of nice to hear someone else talk about a movie that I haven't seen. From what I know is that it's it knows how to do jump scares very well. 
from what I've heard. Yeah. Where it's not just like a cat jumping at the screen and it's like a fake one. Yeah. And you know? it hits like all of those points too of like something is under your bed scratching or like mm-hmm. you know, something's in the closet and something's coming up behind you in the dark. It's just like hitting all those good points. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a really good movie overall. Nice. Again, I don't know much about Lights Out. Other than it's just a really fun, like, little paranormal horror film. I do. I'm lost, like, into the psychology of it, too, because there there is some psychology stuff that comes up where the mother has a mental illness and you kind of explore, like, her going into, like, a ward and how her best friend named Diana Mm -hmm. was, like, very attached to her and controlling of her. Mm. And then Diana, like, had this disease where she couldn't be in the sunlight and she always had to be like under an umbrella or something oh wait i know that disease um yeah yeah i know exactly i don't know the name of it that makes a lot of sense yeah Yeah, so diana was like not able to go out in the sunlight um i don't remember specifically but i think she died from being in the ward and then doing something to treat her or something or punish her i don't remember Mm -hmm. but i know she like obviously died and then the mother lived on and then diana still like appeared in the mother's life but this time as a shadow person Mm. because obviously sunlight hurts her skin Mm -hmm. and then the mother also has to take pills but diana is like it's feeding into schizophrenia too, where Diana will not let her take pills, because Diana knows as the mother gets more well, then she will disappear more. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so it's kind of hallucinations as well. I kind of want to check this out now. I didn't hear much about that side of things about the film because mm-hmm. I mostly heard about like, oh, this is a very scary film, and it really plays mm-hmm. on like your fear of the dark but i don't know i like that little angle i mean one thing we'll notice especially like paranormal and ghosts um they really play into like the mental illness angle of a lot of things Mm -hmm. where it's like is this ghost just a figment of their imagination is it a hallucination or is this an actual freaking demon (laughs) right and i don't know that much about like the real world aspect of that and like how many people see figures like this and that's such, but I like that film can kind of just take it that extra step and like we're just gonna get buck wild and make a really fun horror film. Mm-hmm. I don't know any of the actors or actresses that are in the film, so I really can't go into that. But I don't either, honestly. I guess they were good. Let's just say that. Let's just assume they they were good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Any final thoughts on like Lights Out before we move on? I think mm-hmm. I just recommend it. That was Cat's film, Lights Out, that she wanted to bring to the table. So we're going to move on now. All right. We're going to move on to my good friend, Gavin. Uh, What movie do you have with us today? Uh, Today, I've come to talk about the 2014 As Above, So Below. Mm -hmm. And also just going to touch on It Lives Inside, a 2023 movie as well. So you want to give like a quick like synopsis of what As Above, So Below is? Certainly. Um... You got your main character, uh, Scarlet. She's a daughter of a archaeologist mm-hmm. who's been in search of the Philosopher's Stone, mm-hmm. something that anyone can create any metal and turn it into pure gold at that point. Yep. Uh, and so ends up going on this crazy adventure, kind of in a pseudo documentary style, in terms of like how it's filmed and portrayed has a little bit of that Blair Witch feel to it of kind of shaky. Better quality in terms of camera, but definitely still has that uh, mockumentary feel, I guess. But uh, it takes them on a nice little journey into Paris <laughs> and the catacombs below the city, and they en- enter into, uh, as I've seen theorized online, the seven layers of hell mm-hmm. going all the way down to try and find the philosopher's stone and they only come to find out that there is nothing but death and despair that uh follows them mm-hmm. especially going through seeing cultists people who've lived down there for years at a time maybe dead 
just different apparitions uh, forming in front of their eyes that really just creates this suspense and fear within you. Just a crazy long anxiety attack, it feels like, watching that movie. That's an interesting way to put it, yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I mean, I've seen really. parts of the film, and I know about like the whole aspect of them venturing lower and lower into hell. Yeah, no, I find that really interesting because, like, I don't know, as someone who also loves like Full Metal Alchemist, hearing them talk about the Ooh. hearing them talk about the Philosopher's Stone, I was like, oh yeah, that thing. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, they definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely the same one at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the things that people will end up doing for that, uh, or just that power, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's it's an endless sort of uh, hunger and craving oh, yeah. and except it, it it's touched on or at least that hunger and craving for that sort of power. It's kind of touched on in this as well uh, because the, as I said, Scarlet, her father was an archeologist kind of searching for this and he ends up uh, dying without ever having a clue of where this is. Mm-hmm. So, it's basically not her hunger, but her father's hunger, and to finish his legacy. And he died being called crazy. And that's the last thing you want out of someone that you've truly admired your entire life. Mm-hmm. So she has that hunger to prove that he wasn't just crazy. He was um, a stand-up guy, and he knew what he was talking about, mm-hmm. and especially when it came to these ancient artifacts it was something that was real and tangible and ends up proving it through countless deaths and terrifying (laughs) discoveries left and right uh it's Mm -hmm. and especially going in with into the catacombs half the time you you see that one thing i'm really looking for in a like a good film is that everything makes sense and it really makes sense in this that when they're walking into these catacombs first off they're getting chased by police getting in there Mm -hmm. uh just finding different ways to get in without really being detected Uh, but when these nine individuals end up going in they come to discover that there's a bit of a cave in as well so a lot of them didn't even want to be there in the first place. They just kind of wanted to show you in, and then I'm getting out of here before anything goes sour, I guess. But you definitely see that once these uh, catacombs start to collapse and their exit is now gone, mm-hmm. there is a sense of fear and that suspense, as I was mentioning before. It really just holds weight over the viewer, and now they have to figure out a way to get out and for seven of them representing your seven layers of hell mm-hmm. uh it doesn't end too well for them and then <laughs> I, I i won't say too much but two people do make it out and it turns out that they come out through a manhole in paris i saw that was a really cool shot too because the whole it really is because it seems like they're continuously going down uh-huh. and down but then they open up this manhole and it feels like the world completely flips upside down mm-hmm. and they're right back up in the streets of Paris. Yeah. I, I thought that was a really cool shot. I saw that shot. Like I saw oh, a little it, bit of this film recently. So I saw I remember yeah. that shot. I was like, Oh yeah, that is like really clever. Like, it's, it's a it? very artistic way to go about it. Uh-huh. And that anything beyond and in that, I guess, realm is supernatural mm-hmm. and is not, belonging to earth in that sense yeah i guess i i see what you mean i definitely see what you mean and yeah I, why do you choose this uh, movie specifically this is my uh i guess personal favorite mm-hmm. simply because yeah. of course i've seen your conjuring exorcist any of your classic um paranormal movies but when this had come out i decided yeah, this is a great idea as a 14-year-old to watch this alone at 2 a.m. with the lights off, and I just didn't sleep for, like, a solid two days afterwards. (laughs) 
it, it just had that grip on me because it has it's very rooted in reality and you can see at least up until a certain point yes this could 100 percent happen 100 percent be real mm-hmm. and it definitely fits in that uh mockumentary style where it definitely is immersive and it isn't just a bunch of cut shots you mm-hmm. you get your long one takes and uh or one shots and it's it, it really feels like you are in that uh reality i also really like that when you're down in the like catacombs and you're going deeper and deeper i remember really enjoying the like that feeling of like claustrophobia where it's just like oh yeah where it's i don't know I've, out of doubt. I've done a little bit of caving in my life yep. not a lot but that feeling of like i'm stuck i don't know how to get out of here i've had that happen before and it and is that's, not fun <laughs> that's exactly what they touch on they have um I forget the character's name off the top of my head here, mm-hmm. but uh, what they, at least when it comes to crawling through these catacombs, it's lined with bone for half a kilometer, half a mile. I forget which they use. It's Paris, so I would assume kilometer. Yeah. But uh, as they're crawling through these uh, bones, trying to find a different passageway to get deeper into the uh, system, I guess, mm-hmm. they definitely give you that sense of claustrophobia and they even have one of the characters get like sort of stuck and it he begins to have this panic attack and he begins to freak out (laughs) and it lends itself to that mockumentary feel because the emotion really pours out and you just want to get up and help that individual as well through those bones and especially <laughs> crawling through bones and being claustrophobic mm-hmm. not really the <laughs> highlight or the way i'd want to be stuck between a rock and well bones <laughs> there's some other things that i know they get into later in the movie that i don't want to really spoil but swimming through that no definitely not hell no <laughs> there's there's one guy i bow down to at this point just watching his performance back uh la taupe i'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly mm-hmm. but it it i believe it roughly translates to the mole and this guy had lived down in these catacombs for i believe it's up to three years mm-hmm. it, until that point in the story so granted he is really into that uh paranormal or supernatural feel because nobody's surviving down in absolute darkness for three years exactly so he's he kind of jumps all over the place Mm -hmm. in terms of being able to get somewhere extremely fast in pitch blackness and it 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 almost feels like you're supernatural beings where they're able to just almost teleport from one place to another Mm -hmm. within the blink of an eye yeah i mean he he it also makes it a little bit more real because of the found footage style where it's just like wait how do you do that <laughs> yeah yes without a doubt that it that's what really hooks me as a viewer mm-hmm. all right is um, how, how much can i suspend my disbelief and with this one there is no suspending disbelief you're believing it the entire time hmm. yeah i gotta i gotta watch this movie in full i definitely do it looks like a very fun I would time. highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, do you have any final thoughts on As Above, So Below before we move on to your other pick? IMDb has it at a 6.2 out of 10. I say that they are wrong. I'd at least give it an 8 to an 8.5. Mm-hmm. So I do have to point out that like even the best movies have only like 8. So, like That is so true. So... Having a six out of ten on IMDb is not that bad. It's still above right. average. That means it's above average, which is, which on IMDb. Me, but I mean, it, it's it, it passes. Oh uh, yeah, it passes. It passes. <laughs> it passes. No, there's definitely someone like your Rotten Tomatoes that have like a fifty, but the audience score will give you like a one hundred on that. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I guess to move on a little bit, Mm -hmm. there's one that is still in theaters. I won't talk too much about it, but I'll sing its praises and see if uh, anyone in the audience here is a fan of these sorts of films. Comment below. 
uh, like and subscribe. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But no, uh, it lives inside. It's uh -huh. uh, 2023. I believe it's still in theaters. I had seen it just a few weeks ago. But it was very, uh, I'd almost say one-to-one -one in terms of if you've seen Bye Bye Man. That came out like 2018, I think, or something. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's definitely where this supernatural spirit has been unleashed into the world. And now these, I guess, kids pretty much have to go along and contain this being, even though many don't believe that it's even real, let alone among your people. And it is very it, it's definitely like bye bye man in the sense where this creature that you can hardly see is able to take control of a being or manipulate its surroundings into killing mm -hmm. especially the ones that it's trying to target mm. All right. and it, it's also trying to be more than yourself at the end of the day hmm it's a great kind of coming of age story in that sense. Interesting. How would you say is the horror? Is it like rated R? Is it PG thirteen? Like, is it? Like, I can look that up right is it now. Very, actually, is it very gruesome, or does it really keep to that? Like, this is for everybody. Oh, it definitely has age. your gruesome moments. Interesting. But I think it it is PG thirteen. Okay. Okay. So, so it has your PG-13 level of violence. Okay. I mean, you can get away with some stuff as long as you're very... Oh, yeah. Coy oh, yeah. It. Yeah. Moments are a little corny, but they you can easily look past them to the better parts mm -hmm. and just the absolute destruction that this monster is able to bring upon the living. Interesting. Well, I have not, I have not heard about this film. And I usually keep my ear to the ground on a lot of things. So thank I you for... I hadn't either, but... I was luckily brought along, and I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Nobody else was in the theater, so... Oh, that, that's the best, dude. When you can just, like, oh, yeah. have it to yourself, and just, like, you, if you want to say anything to the screen, you can. Like, oh, it's so oh, yeah. fun. So fun. I was yelling out stuff. Me and the person I went with, we just had a good time. We were talking about it and everything. Nice. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was super fun. Mm-hmm. But no, yeah. I would say it's a really great film. Mm -hmm. It's a very easy uh, to like ease your way into this sort of genre in like a paranormal activity sort of deal. I gotcha. It gets your feet wet for sure. Oh, okay. That sounds sounds really but good. But still, will scare the ever loving out of you. Okay. Well, there is those moments. So that yeah, that's what I have to say for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing your picks today. I really like that they're not like your traditional, like, uh, as you said, it's traditional scary uh, paranormal movies that you would usually hear. That you, we did talk more about the first time we talked about paranormal movies. But I like that you oh, kind of talked about these different... The, they have their paranormal-esque yeah. or feel to it, but there is other things to it. Mm -hmm. The underappreciated ones, I should say. Yeah. 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 Thank you for doing that and... Yeah, we're going to... Thank you for having me on. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to the next pick. Oh, what do you know? I'm the next person. And this is going to be the final review thing that we're going to be doing. And the movie I brought today is a recent film. This is a movie we talked about earlier, not in this episode, but like episodes past in the internet horror episode. Uh, it's a little film called Talk to Me. It came out this summer. I wasn't able to see it during the summer. I must have been busy with either the show or just anything else going on. And uh, I finally got a chance to watch it, like just less than an hour ago and i really like this film i think it is such a great like directorial debut for uh danny and michael filippo it's just so masterfully done like it knows how to play on each emotion especially like the fear of it all the feeling of like you don't know what's going to happen next just the shot types to convey like when people are getting possessed just so well done and like oh man like just bravo to them and it's really cool to see just like youtubers making the jump to like hollywood pictures and stuff like that it just i love this movie so much i had a friend tell me that they didn't like it so i kind of was not really wanting to see it because i was like ah, eh, well or maybe it wasn't as good as people said it was i don't know what he was doing but my i this film is so fucking fantastic 
I'll just say this, the thing that I don't know a lot of people are going to talk about, but I just love the camera work and how they set up shots, the the framing, the blocking, everything was just so well done. And they know exactly what to do to make something just look creepy and scary and like it's just a very uncomfortable feeling you feel throughout the entire film. When I heard it was a movie made by the Rocka Rocka guys, I expected it was like a very intense gore filled show, maybe with a little bit of comedy. But I feel like what this is is just like it's so it takes the paranormal genre and the possession genre in a really interesting direction. It's not like your typical exorcist film because like in those films, like they treat like the the moment of like the exorcism as like this really big taboo. And it's just like, oh, you know, like why would any person in their rightful mind want to mess around with these spirits? I feel like this film gives an answer to that. And it's not an answer that I particularly like, but it makes so much sense for just like the climate and entertainment that we're in today of just like this go for broke, like film it and post it on YouTube kind of mentality of just all these like of these horrible things being done. And what the film revolves around is just like there's this embalmed hand that they really don't know where it came from. They think it's a real hand. They think it may be just like a little statue. They Some think it's like the hand of a Satanist. Some think it's a hand of like a psychic who could talk to the dead. No one knows. I like that they kept it very vague. And so a bunch of like teenagers in, I believe this takes place. It def, def, it's definitely an Australian film. I'll get to that in a bit. But a bunch of teenagers are just messing around with the hand. And you just see this. And you just see like. It's it's a it's an interesting commentary on like how idiotic like this new generation kind of is of just like of just as I said film it and post it like they just start messing with this hand and getting possessed and of course when you mess with something you don't know the full extent of bad shit happens and throughout the film like they're starting to see ghosts everywhere um, one of their friends gets possessed and brutally harmed it's just an interesting mind fuck throughout the rest of the film of just like what's going on and i don't know what's going to happen next because i don't know how they're going to get themselves out of this situation it just seems like there's no way to get out which kind of makes you feel really uncomfortable throughout the entire film of like i don't know what's going to happen next and i'm really worried i thought it was a bad thing throughout watching the film but then kind of towards the end when you do get that like little bit of resolution at the very least you understand like why the film was putting you in there in that headspace because it's this tension that constantly just gets revved up and yeah it's just so good like i just really like this film um i just want to shout out like the main actress sophie wilde she was fantastic i thought like if she wasn't good like this actress wasn't good this film would break instantly but she manages to be not only relatable emotional and terrifying at the same time because she manages to play so many different things and different angles to this character in watching her in the possessed scenes you just really see her acting chops like really pop out and just like yeah it's just just really really good like stuff and just i hope we see more of her um i do know that they're coming out with a sequel to this i don't i don't know how i feel about that at the moment because after just watching it there's a way that i can see them taking it but i would and i hope that it's just not a retread of this movie but I don't know, it's an A24 film, or it was picked up by A24, I should say. And yeah, like, stay true to your roots of what this is. I talked a little bit earlier about how this film is very Australian, and yeah, this is, they are not afraid, like, just the cussing and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I don't want to say the C word on the channel, but yeah, like, there's that a ton of times. And it's just treated as, like, nothing. And I just love that. I just love that the film is definitely unique to a very specific culture. And I'm not meaning like a, like a very like a religious culture. I just mean like geographically. Like I just felt like I was just hanging out with a bunch of like really cool Australian people the entire time and watching their YouTube videos. You can definitely see their brand of humor show up throughout like the scenes where the teens are just having fun. And another thing that Rocka Rocka was very known for was their gore. And I feel like this film does have that. 
it's not evil dead levels of gore but there is a scene that did make me wince and there's a couple things that i thought were a little disgusting but on all angles as a horror fan i felt very good like it felt very well kept i felt like in no pun intended in good hands like the directors knew what they were doing and this was just a labor of love and you can every frame of this thing was so well thought out like yeah just such a well done movie i can't believe like it took me this long to see it but I'm glad that I get to talk about it now and instead of like The Exorcist Believer, which I've already heard is not good. And I didn't want to spend my money on that, but spending my spending a couple bucks to get the Blu-ray of this because physical media that rocks was very much worth it. And I'm definitely going to try to watch this movie more and more for the rest of Halloween. That's all I really got to say about Talk To Me. Just a really good film. I loved it and I hope that like this like gets out there and lets people know that like it is a good film i already know that a bunch of people have talked about it but like still just one to add to the fire is never that bad yeah that's pretty much it i'm gonna wrap this episode up entirely like i appreciate thank you everybody who did their little segment thank you for taking your time out of your day to do this for me it was very nice and i really like all the films that you guys chose uh we still got one more video to do for the graveyard shift and that's going to be releasing on halloween and it's a little spooky surprise for you guys. Um, so please subscribe to the channel. Please like, subscribe, and share. And yeah, this has been The Graveyard Shift. Um, I hope you have a good day. Bye.